in fact, people who have ADHD actually have an easier time experiencing hypnosis than neurotypical people. Probably because of the imagination piece and because of, of time distortion. It's the imagination piece. We're very good at going into our imagination, getting lost in there sometimes, and um, having no idea what time it is. I kind of think that there possibly could be something around being in a hypnotic-like state that is some part Hmm. of the ADHD. ADHD Rewired, episode 264. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Linda Donalds. Linda was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult in her early 40s, now about six years ago. And like so many who were diagnosed later in life, the ADHD diagnosis helped explain so many of her struggles. Professionally, Linda is a board-certified hypnotist and is definitely the first hypnotist we've ever had on the podcast. She's been an active member of the National Guild of Hypnotists for over 20 years and in recent years has shifted her focus to using hypnosis specifically for helping adults and teens struggling with ADHD and I also believe sleep-related issues with ADHD. Yes. Now, before we get started, I want to say that Linda was a, an alumni of one of our coaching and accountability groups and also knows that I'm somewhat skeptical of hypnosis, partially because I don't know enough about it or how it works, partially because I haven't seen any research to support its efficacy with ADHD, and partially because it kind of just sounds a little woo-woo. All that being said, I'm going to be, I'm going to set aside all my prejudgments. And I'm going to be open and curious during this conversation. So, uh, Linda, thank you for, for coming on. And I'm, I am looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing what's been my passion for over 20 years now and Helping people like you understand what hypnosis actually is. Yeah, I, I, I am sure that there's a lot of misunderstandings myth about it. Oh, well, there's tons. I was at a network meeting last night, just a business networking event for local towns around here. And I uh, was talking to a man who <laughs> totally didn't know what it was and was apprehensive, but he stayed in the conversation with me. And so we'll share part of how I talked to him on this podcast so, okay. Yeah. You know, what, one of the things I thought was really interesting, uh, Linda, before we, right before we hit record, is you actually shared yeah. with me that you were feeling a little uh, nervous to do this specifically because you weren't sure how um, your professional uh, organization, other, other hyp- hypnotists, will uh, sort of react or respond to just the ideas around ADHD. Yeah, I've been teaching about. Uh, ADHD at my convention, um, the National Guild, uh, National Guild of Hypnotists convention. We have that every August. And I've been a presenter there for the last four years. This August will be my fifth year giving my presentation on hypnosis for adults and teens with ADHD. And um, I've had to debunk a lot of myths and misconceptions about ADHD. And I always think, like, it's interesting that I've chosen <laughs> to work with ADHD and hypnosis, the two most misunderstood things mm. there are, <laughs> and to debunk myths and misconceptions about both of them. Interesting. And yeah. um, there's a lot of, um, uh, well, you know, there's a lot of people that are confused about things about ADHD. And then there's a lot of people confused about what hypnosis is. And um, so I've had the privilege of helping correct things in both areas. Mm. So, 
So when you think about the the concerns that you're having um, from your your uh, uh, professional colleagues in hypnosis, what are those specific concerns? There are a couple of them. One is that we all know, as we learn more about ADHD, that there's a concern out there that it's overdiagnosed. And that there are people diagnosed with it that don't actually have it and th- things like that. Um, Which and to set and the record not straight, while, while that is partially true that there are people who are diagnosed with it that don't actually have it. The other side of that is that there are more people who are is, not diagnosed with it who actually exactly. have it. <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. Yes. And um, is so... There are some of my colleagues that have been diagnosed with ADHD. They probably haven't talked too much about it openly to our colleagues. Um, And there are those that suspect they have it, but haven't gone to get diagnosed. And then there are people uh, that just think it's a label. And in the world of hypnosis, we're very much aware of how suggestions are absorbed into the innermost mind and how our minds are so incredibly powerful that we can produce uh, behaviors and also physical sensations based on thoughts that we accept it as true. And when somebody is diagnosed with ADHD in hypnosis land, <laughs> we wonder if um, that diagnosis actually is a suggestion and that we then act out of what we are told are ADHD symptoms and that they're not uh, like a, a true physical mm-hmm thing that we were born with, that it's more of a hypnotic suggestion. So that becomes a bit of a challenge sure. because I, I don't believe that. I don't think it's a label. I think it's real. I think that all the research points to a actual real condition. I think Russell Barkley has you know, a lot of that research and, mm-hmm. and uh, Thomas Brown. And, um, and so that's a it's a bit of a thing I have to interact with yeah. colleagues. Like it's not a label. There's also uh, I, I do see people struggle with how to not have the all the things they know about ADHD then create more struggles for them. Um, and I don't know how to articulate what I want to say there, but sometimes we. Uh, you know, there's there's that fine line between using ADHD as an explanation right. versus an excuse. Mm-hmm. And so, not letting your ADHD totally define you in a negative way. Right. Um, and right. that's... Uh, so, sometimes I think people do certain behaviors because they think that's ADHD. Sure, so I have ADHD, more, so maybe I can't that. that actually right. is a more of right. a suggestion. Mm-hmm. That's more acting upon a suggestion or something that you think is true, but maybe it isn't true for you. All right, Linda, so let's... There's an awful lot of good strengths and qualities with ADHD, yeah, let, so... Let, so, I, you know, <laughs> depending on how new listeners are to the podcast, let's uh, um, first, I guess, uh, you know, we're not going to dive in right away about ADHD. Let's di- I want to dive in first on mm-hmm. hypnosis. Hypnosis what is and, hypnosis. Like you, you have, like, yeah. you pull out your like your 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 uh, your um, what do they call it? That little watch thing that you pocket go watch. back. And, yeah, your pocket watch, and tell me you are getting very sleepy. Well, if you, if you look in the background I've here, been, I've got my um, hypnotic uh, disc. I've been distracted there, of course, by the that listeners since can't we started see it, here. So no. just for people, it's uh, very cliche. I have it for fun. <laughs> for 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 the uh, listeners, since this is an audio podcast, I imagine like one of those really big like uh, suckers the spiral suckers that you get at like the carnivals that are you know that are just really big but just black and white so they would be like imagine it turning yeah. and so I've been totally distracted by that the entire time but I've been trying to keep yeah. my attention on Linda so tell us what <laughs> is I sit up more and kind uh, of block it <laughs> so, so now tell us what is hypnosis so there there's a lot of myths and misconceptions okay. about hypnosis. There are people that have had some past experience, usually uh, through a stage show that's done for entertainment, mm-hmm. and they will have this impression that they can't be hypnotized. There's also people who have ADHD, and they know that there's something about being able to focus, and they're like, well, I, don't, I can't be hypnotized. I have ADHD. I can't focus. And actually, that's about as 
furthest from the truth as there could be. But the thing about hypnosis is that it is a state where your brain waves uh, will slow down. When we're in a awake, alert state doing stuff, we're in a beta wave brain state. Okay. And when you start to you know relax or, or move slower or whatever, or put your attention on something, you don't actually have to physically not be moving, um, but you put your attention on something, your brain waves will slow down. You'll do that when you watch TV and read a book and other different things. And as you, um, as the brain waves slow down, you have an easier time focusing. And the more relaxed you get, you'll go into deeper states of alpha and um, perhaps get down into theta. Uh, similar to what happens when you go to sleep. And what, what is to explain, explain to us what that all means. So... Let me explain it in a slightly different way because I also like to specialize in sleep. Okay. So I have, I have things about sleep and hypnosis and ADHD. So when we go to sleep at night, you know, as you're getting ready for bed, you probably are in a beta brainwave state. Your brain's a little more active. And then as you start to wind down to get ready for bed and maybe you've gotten in bed and pulled the sheets over, you turn the light off, your brain will slow down into alpha. You're still alert, but you're starting to shift into sleep. And then as you go into sleep, your brain waves will shift from alpha down into theta. And there's a whole cycle pattern it does. It goes down into delta, which is your deep, deep sleep. And you don't tend to dream during that time. Hypnosis follows similar brainwave patterns like that, although we don't go into delta. Um, when you get down into alpha and theta, you become more imaginative, your imagination becomes a lot more heightened when your brain waves slow down. Mm -hmm. And that's when in, in sleep, you would be dreaming during that time. So I feel like I'm kind of going on a roundabout way trying to explain this. But when people go into hyp hypnosis, they're basically slowing their brain waves down. They're opening themselves up to be more tapping into that part of the brain that's more imaginative. So creative, and, um, calmer, focused... Um, is it similar to like a flow state? Yes. Okay. Yes. And okay. it is basically the same thing as doing meditation. Okay. Okay. Um, there's some slight differences between meditation and hypnosis as far as brainwave states go. They, when they've um, hooked somebody up with all the little wires and everything mm -hmm. to do an EEG, mm -hmm. the brainwave states are a little bit different between hypnosis versus sleep versus meditation, but they're an awful lot alike. Hypnosis is almost like being on the edge of sleep without actually falling asleep. Okay. Which is a lot like how meditation is. It's like you're not asleep, but you're not totally awake when you do meditation with your eyes closed. Meditation has ways of doing it with eyes open too. So um, now another way to explain hypnosis rather than looking at like brainwave states, because that's more the scientific way of looking at what's going on in the brain. But what I always describe or define hypnosis with it having three characteristics. When okay. these three characteristics exist together, you have a hypnotic state. And people will have experiences, they don't even know to label it as hypnosis. Hypnosis happens to be a normal, natural, everyday occurrence for people. They just don't have a label for it. And what happens is when you start to focus in on something, it doesn't matter what it is, and that's something that you focus your attention on could be external to you in your environment, or it could be internal, something you're thinking okay. about in your mind and you focus on it. That starts the process as you become focused in on something, your brain waves will start to drop. But the second thing that'll happen is you start to heighten your imagination. You can imagine things using all five senses, visually, auditorily, kinesthetically with texture and temperature, um, and taste and smell. And you can use your imagination uh, to recreate those things uh, through imagination in a more heightened way than when you're not in hypnosis. Okay. Um, things that aren't actually there in your environment, but you can recreate them. You may know that you're imagining them, be clear about that, or you may go much deeper into that state where it becomes real and you don't distinguish between what you're imagining and something that 
hasn't actually happened around you. So, and that has more to do with how deeply you've gone into imagination. The third thing that happens, so you get the first is focused attention is one. The second one is a heightened imagination state with all five senses. And the third one is time distortion. Well, we do now that pretty one easily. That you, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a minute. But you know, time distortion. When you're in a state of hypnosis, it is almost impossible to know how much time is passing. Hmm. And that can I'm occur in different many, ways. You just hear <laughs> Perception. Well, you know, you're getting right to where I'm like, this is where ADHD just ties right, in. Right, so right, nice. now, right now, Linda, I'm but, wondering uh, how many people listening, like, well, does it just mean that I'm like always in a state of, of hypnosis? <laughs> this is a curious thing that I would love to do some research on because it's okay. actually been the thought that I've had ever since I got diagnosed with ADHD and I started to understand it and the t- time distortion for me is just unbelievable. It's mm. probably one of the main things that made me go find out if this is what I was dealing with was the incredible time distortion. And yet I was very aware of time distortion as far as hypnosis goes. So I've been curious about that. Um, but time distortion occurs with hypnosis, maybe with ADHD, as either it's a perception thing. It's either feels like hypno, like your your experience in that state was either much longer mm-hmm. than it actually was, like time stretched way out, or you perceived it as being much briefer mm-hmm. than it actually was. Say, for example, you were in hypnosis for thirty minutes and then you emerged out of it. Your perception might be that that thirty minutes felt like five minutes tops. Or that 30 minutes might have felt like you were in that state for an hour or two, you mm-hmm. know, but it was only 30 minutes. Sleep does that too. When you wake up, especially after having a dream, you'll be like, yeah. God, I must have been having that dream for like a couple of hours. But then maybe you had woken up and looked at a clock and then fallen asleep and then had a dream. And then you're looking at the clock going, it felt like a three hour dream. But according to my clock, I've only been asleep for like, 30 minutes yeah so it happens with sleep we don't necessarily realize that we've been asleep for as many hours as we have because we're not aware when we're in a sleep state but the and and not aware in a sleep state but i want also to find that when you're in hypnosis you are aware there you're not unconscious and that's a huge misconception is people think when they go into hypnosis they won't know anything that's going on. They think that it'll be like having fallen asleep and woken up later and they won't remember a thing. That doesn't typically happen with a client. Sometimes when they're um, been very familiar with the process, they might just relax so much they forgot what happened during the time because it was so pleasant. And uh, But most of the time, people remember what happened during their session when they come out of hypnosis. Well, one of the things, Linda, that I'm actually uh, sort of curious about as we're kind of getting into this is, um, mm. you know, I know that you do uh, stuff around sleep and, you know, I think there's, it's one thing to sort of talk about it and describe it and maybe another thing to do it and experience it. And as I told yeah. you, I'm, I'm going to be in the, the role of uh, of the the curious uh one who is just you know wants to understand it more i'm wondering if that's something that we can maybe try here yeah I, you had mentioned that earlier when we were setting up for doing this interview so and, if, uh, if you're but, if you're open to that what i would like to do first yeah. is take a quick break um because i don't want my time distortion to get away from me of uh that, that, that marker where i want to take a quick break but then we're going to uh we're going to come right back and uh Linda's going to do some voodoo magic i'm just kidding uh she, <laughs> voodoo gonna magic. Some, i'm sure it's one of the things you hear um uh, with me, so well, yeah, it's a quite familiar comment. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure like, oh, sh- stop perpetuating the myths. Um, so, But they're kind of fun, uh, and then we'll dismantle them. And okay, see all right. We'll behind. dismantle That's them okay. right after okay. the break. Uh, the break. We're going to come back with Linda Donalds. We will be right back. 
If you've been listening to ADHD Rewired for a while, then you know about our flagship coaching program that offers intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups three times a week for 10 weeks. But ADHD doesn't go away after these 10 weeks of coaching, even at three times a week. And neither does the ADHD Rewired coaching experience. After members complete our 10-week program, they can join in on our alumni membership community for ongoing support, where I facilitate weekly planning sessions where we have a monthly webinar and workshops and where members have access to adult study hall on demand a dedicated zoom room where you can work on whatever you want to whenever you want to with other alumni and other members of our coaching groups. As one of our alumni recently put it, maintenance is next level stuff. You know, ADHD management isn't a sprint. It's a marathon fueled by ongoing connection and support. Start your ADHD rewired coaching journey with our 10 week coaching intensive program. Maintain your progress and continue your growth in our membership community exclusively for coaching group alumni. Come experience the ADHD Rewired Coaching Group Difference. Registration for our summer sessions will be announced soon. Summer sessions are going to be July 11th through September 20th. With only two sections this summer, you'll want to sign up as soon as registration is announced. Avoid FOMO or fear of missing out and go to coachingrewired.com and sign up for our email newsletter so you will be one of the first people to know when registration opens. The website again is coachingrewired.com Dot com. That's coachingrewired.com. You know, this is a week where we are celebrating some anniversaries. The first anniversary we are celebrating this week is the anniversary of this podcast. It was five years ago this week that the first three episodes together were launched on iTunes. And I did a, a Google search for what is the appropriate gift for a, a five-year anniversary. And uh, and Google told me that it's wood. So with that in mind, would you like to become a patron at the $5 a month level? Would you like to join me every fourth Tuesday of the month for a small group coaching session just for patrons? Would you like to get access to my webinar on adulting and my webinar on productivity? If you would, then come to ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. Now, I said this is a week of anniversaries. This is also this week is Friday. My wife and I are going to be celebrating our 10 year wedding anniversary. So to all of my listeners and to my wife, thank you for sticking with me, for supporting me, for encouraging me and for helping me grow. For everyone who is in this community, who listens to this podcast, whether you're new or you've been listening, possibly all the way from the beginning. Thank you for your support. And if you haven't done so already, please consider becoming a patron. It really does help me do all the things that I do to help you. Go to patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. And thanks. All right. We are back with Linda Donalds and we are going to uh, we're going to dive into doing some uh, some hypnosis. Can we just dive right in? We can. Um, I do want to, uh, you know, since we're, we're going to do a hypnotic experience uh, live, and this is a podcast, and I, I know for me, when I'm listening to your podcast and a few others I listen to, I'm in the car. <laughs> I was wondering if okay. you were going to uh, make that, that uh, disclaimer. Yeah, of so, so, yeah, so I do need to uh, let people know that if they are in the car, like I listen to my podcast, they ought to pause and resume it another time. Or I don't know if it's feasible for them to like pull over and park the car somewhere for just a few minutes. Are, just stop. <laughs> because uh, highway, even just though, stop. Well, here's the thing is you will go into hypnosis when you're driving a car, but I'm not doing that version of it. Mm. One of the things I wanted to point out when we were talking about the uh, the three criteria or characteristics of hypnosis is that they occur naturally multiple times in the day and driving a car happens to be one of them. <laughs> so when people go in and out of hypnosis, well, the natural occurrence is people don't know to label it as such and they don't realize that when they go in and out of the state, 
that there's other possible uses for that state that could be quite beneficial to them. They're just things that happen in the day. Okay. Um, and so uh, when people experience this guided hypnosis experience, it's it actually will be familiar because you've already done it probably a few times today already. And so it's nothing kind of weird or strange. Um, okay. But it's guided and therefore it has i have extra suggestions for things like relaxation because it enhances it hypnosis is not synonymous with relaxation but it definitely helps and i use lots of that people need to do stress reduction anyway so okay and uh so for those because i put those kinds of suggestions and they don't want to be driving and relax and drive off the road so (laughs) So if you're listening to the podcast and you don't heed uh, uh, Linda's suggestion to uh, not really listen while driving to this part of the podcast. I am um, not responsible. You've been warned. (laughs) Uh, They've uh, been warned and I'm not responsible because they should pull over and be in a safe place. Just in case you completely tuned out for the last like minute and a half, what we just said is if you're driving, pause the, the audio for right now. Yes. Right. Or any other machinery or places where you should have your full attention on like that. Like bulldozers, um, uh, if you're on a large yeah. scaffold, uh, you know, yeah. all right. Running heavy equipment we, in the workplace. Our, our listeners are smart, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <and, laughs> so all these disclaimers as hypnotists so have to like, I know, preface it's, it's really our hypnosis session. <laughs> I know. It's they like even I, have to do that when I, I, I often hear other, other podcasts who are, you know, in the, the some kind of helping profession and they'll say like, what you hear on this podcast should not be substituted for, you know, medical advice talk to you. I'm like, come on. Like, I, I think people can use common yeah. sense. Well, and that also applies to us. You know, you still have to go see your doctor. Right. So that's true too. But I think people know all these. Just remind you, like at least ten people. Oh crap! I gotta call my doctor. All right, let's go ahead. Let's get started here. All right, all right. We'll do something quick and simple. I actually pulled up something a little earlier that I liked. So um, the first thing, once people are in a safe and comfortable place to be, is to just close your eyes. Just like your Eric closes his eyes, I get to see him. Everybody, I can only hear. But as you're sitting there, and you may be sitting in a chair, you may be laying on a bed or on the couch or whatever, but just kind of tune into your body for a moment. And the first place I want you to focus on is your eyelids. And there are a lot of tiny muscles in around your eyelids, and they're some of the easiest muscles to relax. So when we're talking about relaxation, let's start with the easy parts. Let your eyelids relax. Let them relax so much so that you wouldn't be able to open them even if you tried. It would just be too much effort. They're so comfortably relaxed. And when you know you have them that relaxed, they just won't open. It's too comfortable. Give them a check. You'll find that you cannot open them. And you can let that relaxation that you're allowing to occur in your eyelids to expand and move around, move it up into your eyebrows. Let your eyebrows now become completely relaxed. Let your forehead become completely relaxed. Any concern or worry lines or stress that you might be holding up in your forehead, let it fade and smooth out, become really relaxed. Let the relaxation come down into your cheeks, your jaw, and even your ears. Let them relax. Let your nose, your mouth, your chin relax. Let the relaxation move from your forehead up over the top of your head, through your whole scalp, down into the nape of your neck. It's interesting that we can relax our scalp. We can. There's actually a muscle under there that holds tension. And you can let that relax. But just keep letting that relaxation spread and expand to every muscle, every nerve, every tendon, every joint, every cell of your body. Move it from the neck into the shoulders and the shoulder blades. Let it move down the arms, right down through the elbows and wrists and right out into the hands, up to the very tips of your fingers. As it moves through your torso, it comes down through the back muscles and each vertebrae of your spine relaxes and the chest and stomach muscles, and let that relaxation penetrate into your torso, into every organ 
every cell of your body. Let your heart relax, your lungs, your stomach, your intestines, and everything else in there relax. Become, become comfortable, calm, and peaceful. And let yourself relax through the pelvis and the hips and down the legs, through the knees and the kneecaps, the lower legs, the ankles, spreading from the feet, from the heels, right out to the tips of the toes. And just allow yourself to continue to allow these areas to continue to relax as you listen to the sound of my voice. And with each breath that you take, you can relax more and more. And speaking of the breath that you take, bring your attention to your breath. And just become a passive observer. Notice how you're breathing. You don't have to breathe in any particular way, but just notice. Notice how you breathe in. Notice that point where you've breathed in as far as you're going to breathe in, and the breath turns around to become an exhale. And then notice how you breathe out. And again, when you've breathed out as far as you're going to breathe, notice how the breath pauses, turns around and becomes an inhale. And as you are observing your breath and as you exhale, I want you to imagine that as you exhale, you breathe out anything that no longer serves you. Breathe out with that exhale. Breathe out any stresses from the day, any stresses from yesterday, the day before, from the past weekend, last week, the whole month. The whole year. Breathe out stresses from years gone by. Just breathe them out. They no longer serve you. Stress does not serve any particular useful process for you, especially the ones of the past. You can breathe them out, let them go. Breathe out any worries, concerns, breathe out fears, breathe out chaos and confusion. Breathe out criticisms. Those don't serve you. Breathe out any criticisms that others have given to you, criticized you. Breathe them out. Breathe out any criticisms you've made towards others. And especially breathe out any criticisms you've made towards yourself. These do not serve you. Breathe out anything else that comes to mind, whether that's consciously or subconsciously. Let your subconscious mind breathe out what no longer serves you. Breathing out thoughts, feelings, behaviors, beliefs. Breathe them out. Now, as you breathe out things that no longer serve you, you make room inside yourself for new and good things to come in. So as you breathe in, breathe in new and good things, things that maybe you could use more of, or new things that you haven't yet experienced and you would like to. Breathe in peace. Breathe in comfort. Breathe in confidence. Breathe in any new qualities you'd like to enhance in yourself. In those areas that used to hold on to things that no longer serve you, that you've cleared out by breathing it out, will now fill those areas with peace and joy and confidence. Breathe in the motivation to do those things that are important to you. Breathe in success. And as you go through the rest of today and tomorrow and the days to come, Even while you're in a normal waking awareness state, a non-hypnotic state, you're going to continue to breathe. You don't even need to pay attention to it. Your body just breathes for you. But there will be a part of your inner mind that will continue to do this process for you, even when you're not really focusing on it. So as you go through your day, today, tomorrow, and the days to come, you'll continue to breathe out those things that no longer serve you. And breathe in those things that you could use more of, wonderful qualities, new skills, new behaviors, 
whatever it is that you would like to manifest in your life, your inner mind will continue this process using the breath to guide it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to emerge you out of the state that I refer to as hypnosis. All of my colleagues and those who study hypnosis, we call this hypnosis. There are other names for it, but it is a state of mind where you've become more receptive and more open to receiving positive suggestions for your health and well-being. There are many unlimited uses for this. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but for now, we're going to emerge out of the state of hypnosis. When you emerge, you're going to feel absolutely wonderful. You'll feel calm and peaceful, yet you'll have all the energy you need to do whatever it is you had planned for the rest of the day. You'll feel very focused, be very productive, accomplish things easily. It'll be wonderful. And you'll enjoy a wonderful night's sleep tonight. You'll fall asleep easily, sleep really well, and you'll wake up in the morning feeling wonderfully refreshed and eager for a wonderful new day to begin. And to to guide you out of hypnosis, I'm just going to simply count from the number one on up to five. With each number that I count, you'll emerge out of wherever state of hypnosis you're in, however deep you've gone, you'll emerge. You'll come up 20% from where you are with each number that I count. And when I get to the number five, that'll be 100%. You'll be back into a normal waking awareness, a state of non-hypnosis, really. And just follow my numbers and come back out of this state, beginning with the number one. Number one, becoming more and more aware of your body and where you are, whether you're sitting in a chair, laying on a bed, on a couch or chair, wherever you are. With number two, becoming aware of the energy coming into your body, filling you with a wonderful, pleasant energy to give you all the energy you need to do whatever you had planned for the day. With the number three, all the muscles and nerves and everything in your body is working optimally, and you can wiggle your fingers and move your feet around as your body wakes up more and more. But the number four, you're getting ready to open your eyes. It's as if everything's coming more awake to the point where the only thing that remains are those eyelids that are still closed. So let yourself come back up to all that awareness, and on the next number that I say, your eyelids will open and you'll be fully alert back into a normal waking awareness. Number five, fully aware, eyes wide open. Welcome back. Feels wonderful, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it felt very much like a, just like a, a body scan that, uh, that you might experience in like a, a guided meditation. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of similarities between hypnosis and meditation. In fact, uh, when I use the word meditation, I tend to refer to meditation as a state where you're aiming to have your mind be quiet, which for people with ADHD is like an impossible task. How in the world can I get my mind to be quiet? Mm. That's really hard. But true meditation is a state of quiet mind, no mm. thoughts. You might have like a mantra, but once you add guided imagery, into that, technically, you're doing hypnosis. See, the, you know, when we started the podcast and you, we were talking about the myths and misconceptions mm -hmm. and woo-woo voodoo thing <laughs> common all the time, uh, that's been in the history of hypnosis is all this kind of weird stuff. So people some kind of get wigged out over the word hypnosis. So some people have decided that, okay, well, since People get scared over hypnosis, which is just a misconception. They don't understand. We're going to call it meditation. We're going to call it guided imagery. We're going to call it visualizations. And those things were all hypnotic uh, procedures, uh, ways of doing hypnosis. They're not the only ways to do hypnosis. What I did was really a guided imagery but there's a ton of other techniques that I can use that are interactive, that are much more complex, and that resemble a lot more like hypnosis. The way people kind of want to separate hypnosis as being different than meditation. But to me, meditation is, your mind is quiet. I had a, a client recently who has ADHD, 
and she had a practice of doing meditation um, that she had been doing for quite a long time. And she wanted to experience hypnosis for a particular issue she was having trouble with. And so I taught her self-hypnosis. And um, she was like, this is so much easier to do <laughs> than meditation because hypnosis does not require your mind to be quiet. As a matter of fact, I like to use the busy mind. Okay, Linda, when I think about, because, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because so many of these words, whether it's meditation, hypnosis, uh, you know, we all have our own sort of uh, identifications Labels. with it, yeah. right? And so, like, when I think of, hip, uh, of, uh, of meditation, um, specifically around mindfulness-based meditation, you know, it's one, one of the misnomers that I try to, to uh, help people understand is that you don't actually need to have a quiet mind to no. experience mindfulness mindfulness yeah. meditation. It's about noticing yeah. how busy your mind is and just keep bringing it back to a focal point. Um, yeah. And then I definitely have uh, have experienced the, especially because I'm, I'm, I've been a long time inconsistent meditator um, mm -hmm. or it's I'm, I'm on again and off again. Um, and I have absolutely found that when I'm coming back to it, having a, a voice to follow through that meditation way mm -hmm. easier than um, yes. you know, to try to get my myself to focus on a particular thing or point or idea or mm -hmm. even just my voice. Otherwise, it's, you know, watching the theater of my mind, which sometimes is okay, too, because it helps me see, oh, wow, my mind is like super busy right now. I need to like you know, chill the F out right now and uh, like take a break because I didn't even notice how, yeah. you know, how many thoughts were going on in my mind uh, at a given yeah. moment until I paused to notice how many thoughts were going on in my mind at a given moment. Yeah. yeah. One thing that is a little different about doing uh, hypnosis or even self-hypnosis um, versus meditation is that uh, not only do you, you don't need to quiet your mind, but there are other additional things in what I just uh, did as a demonstration that harness the busy thoughts, give them a direction. And whereas meditation tends to be more focused on right here and now, like mm -hmm. bring you from all over the place, past, present, future, whatever, and everything, let's just like just be in this moment, which is incredibly useful. Hypnosis likes to explore past, present, and future. It's not confined to now, okay. which is one big thing that's different between hypnosis and meditation is especially with the use of hypnosis for doing uh, what's often referred to as a progression. A regression is to think back and go back in time to a past event and re-experience it in your mind as a regression, which has in tons of wonderful benefits and uses for it. it's excellent for getting rid of fears and phobias and a number of other issues people deal with but there's also a progression which is to place yourself in a future moment now sometimes people do that incorrectly and create all sort of anxiety and worry because they're putting themselves in the future and thinking how everything could possibly go wrong and this isn't going to happen and I can't do that. Nah, 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 nah. It goes on and on. But in hypnosis, it's powerful to go into that relaxed state, which it began with like a body relaxation. There are other ways to, to go into hypnosis. That's just one. But then to put yourself in a future moment and as vividly as you can use that imagination that we were talking about before with the five senses mm -hmm. to vividly imagine yourself in that future moment and having uh, I, two things that can happen. One is things don't go well, but you like perfectly navigate through things that just aren't going your way. And yet you slip through those things and, and, and react and respond and, and maybe create some things in that messy moment that bring you out on the other side, super successful. It's one, one way of doing it. Or the other is everything does actually go totally perfect. There's not a flaw in the future and you've just done everything wonderfully. Either way, you're seeing yourself responding in the way you want to be. Now, here's the thing is that when people don't practice seeing themselves go through an experience and and having the thoughts and feelings and behaviors that they want to have in the future, if they haven't been doing that and they've been rehearsing the other things that aren't so great, you set yourself up for um, you're going to produce whatever it is that you've been imagining in your mind. 
And part of that is because every time we go into a situation, our mind looks at it and goes, all right, has something like this happened before? Yeah, something like this has happened before. And this is how we got through it. And it runs this like on autopilot, whatever you were imagining or mm-hmm. actually happened. Okay, whatever it's referencing, it's referencing past memories. But if you constantly take your time to pause and think about the best way that you want to be going through a situation and you think about that multiple different times, you're going to put like kind of like a false memory in, but a good one for the subconscious mind to reference so that when that event shows up in reality, it goes, oh, yeah, we've done this like a whole bunch of times. And this is how we did it. And it was great. It turned out wonderful. Your mind doesn't actually know whether that was a real event or something you used in your hypnosis meditation state. It doesn't know. It just knows that's what it referenced. Thought so it's it was sort of real. like every time we thought rem- it would run that. Every time we remember something, we actually uh, mess up the memory because we're recalling it from that moment yeah. and then add whatever was going yeah. on in that moment memories, to that memory. Memories are never going to be accurate ever. Right. It's, it's not just <laughs> us with ADHD. Memory no, no, is a this weird is like thing. a human brain right, thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and the past memories are always uh, recorded um, one from your personal perspective, right. Um, which is whatever age you were, also wherever you were standing in relation to other things in that memory, um, and they're recorded with your emotional content. Yeah, emotional encoding is a huge part of, of huge. The memory. And mm-hmm. they're not accurate. They're just your right. perception. Right. And then later on, when you go and remember something, you're remembering whatever gets stored in your mind but now you're a different age and you're in a different circumstance or scenario and so you're going to alter that memory because you're not who you were when the memory was first laid down so you can't have memories stay accurate and your mind also will insert memories that come out of imagination and not reality and that has nothing to do whether you were intentionally doing hypnosis if you put intentionally because you probably actually went into a state that we could label as hypnosis we didn't know but we put in additional memories out of imagination and that part of the mind doesn't know whether something was real or imagined so but this you can look at this in a couple of ways is like oh false memories are bad and i'm like not if they're inserted for your benefit and are showing how you did something great and we're successful and it well, wasn't it's real sort of the, it's the idea of, of previewing you know we know that when we can visual, yeah. when we can mm-hmm. visualize um, and imagine what we want something to to kind of go to to be like when we experience it it's actually mm-hmm. going to be easier uh because of you know learning and there's a connection with with learning and dopamine and if we can mm-hmm. you know, even just like transitions you know if it, this is something that I, that I teach sometimes is that like if you're feeling stuck like literally like you're in your chair and you're like i have to get up like i I have to go yeah. do said things. I'm looking at the to-do list and like there's this magnetic force for guy like, keeping me to my chair. And I, you know, you <laughs> I know that just close one. your <laughs> eyes and just imagine yourself yeah. like standing up and walking towards the room. And then, and this is a strategy that, that I, that I use. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's, actually helpful and you know yeah. it's just to visualize yourself doing it yeah. makes it easier for your brain to then actually execute the the yep. thing so it's um you know it's uh, plus it, you could you could even take that further and you know think about what is you got to transition into and see yourself doing that thing that's next hey linda speaking of transitioning why, th- into yeah. things let's transition <laughs> to a quick break yeah. and we will uh we will be right. right back <laughs> hey you can join us every second tuesday of the month for adhd rewired's live monthly q a we do this every second tuesday of the month at 12 30 p.m central that is 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern for ADHD Rewired's live monthly Q&A. We do this every second Tuesday of the month. Go to ADHDRewired.com slash events so you can join us on Zoom and get your questions answered. You may also be able to catch us streaming the live Q&A on Facebook as well. So make sure you follow our Facebook page. You can join me and the co-host of the live Q&A, Brendan Mahan, who also hosts the wonderful podcast for parents and teachers about kids, 
ADHD Essentials. That is our other podcast on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. I also want to encourage everyone who uh, probably most of you follow Jessica McCabe on How to ADHD. Jessica and Brendan uh, did a segment about Brendan's model of his wall of awful. And it's animated and it's incredible. And I would encourage you, if you've not seen it, to go check it out. Because maybe you have questions about the wall of awful that you want to ask Brendan. Or questions about accountability or calendars or sleep. Whatever your question is, come join us every second Tuesday of the month. Again, we're doing it next week. The website, one more time, to register for our live Q&A is ADHDrewired.com slash events. We'll see you there. All right, we are back. And uh, so just a quick kind of recap. So we kind of started a little bit about um, uh, what is and isn't meditation. We uh, went through a very uh, nice sort of guided uh, imagery uh, hypnosis. Um, I said meditation, I meant hypnosis. Um, and, well, they're almost uh, the same thing. Yeah, it's, you know, it's uh, maybe you planted that into my mind while we were doing that. It's, <laughs> you know, maybe it's a it's just a, it's a branding issue. You know, it's, it's you know, the, the yeah, it's sort of like ADHD. It's bad branding because it's like it doesn't really describe what it is. No, mm. it doesn't. It totally misses the point of all the wonderful benefits that it has. Not well, to it's take not just, away from the challenges, but, issue. you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even a, yeah. Yeah. It's like a, like a misnomer name on it. Right. Right. All right. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Um, let's say, um, and it's not hard to imagine probably for, for many of our, our listeners here that, uh, sleep is an issue. Um, yeah. so, you know, and, and it's not, and for, for most people who have sleep issues with ADHD, it's not even like I have a, I go to bed fine. I just don't sleep long enough. It's the I'm tired and yet I keep on going. Right? Yep. It's that sleep yeah. procrastination. Um, yep. How do you use hypnosis to help people with that kind of issue? Yeah. So I mean, hypnosis in general can help with sleep in a number of different ways. So you know, most people think of hypnosis to help people um, fall asleep or stay asleep. It's kind of the most common ways of looking at it. And there's definitely a wonderful connection between hypnosis and sleep as far as the brainwave states go that mm -hmm. really helps a lot. We talked about that in the beginning. But hypnosis is used a lot for behavior modification. It is a behavior modification therapy. It's one of the main things of it. It's just done in a different brain state wave, you know, different okay. state of mind. So because it's a behavior modification therapy or modality, it can be used to change behaviors around sleep, not just falling asleep, staying asleep, but also helping people uh, Stop. take a routine that they said that they were going to do. And right. they're like, I can't seem to like do that. I know what the routine would do that would help me fall right. asleep, but I can't seem to do it. So hypnosis can be added in as a way to get the mind to implement that routine that they know they should do. There's a lot of places where hypnosis just helps people do the things they know that they should be doing and they just aren't implementing. And hypnosis helps them actually do those behaviors easily, naturally, almost as if they've always been doing them. So you could use hypnosis. And hypnosis has a couple other things that it, it does. Uh, you know, it's how your brain works. Helping you pick up on things you know, like getting ready for bed at night, often most people do sleep at nighttime unless they're a shift worker and have to sleep during the day. It's right, let, me, let me ask you this. I'm looking at the, the time. We, Linda, we, we have we have about uh, 13 minutes here, and I'm not sure this is enough <laughs> time. Time flies now. by. I yeah, know, right? <laughs> uh, maybe we've been in hypnosis this whole time because didn't you say the time distortion is a big we part have of this? We massive time distortion. You I know? think I could chat so, for three, right. four hours. So if you, um, I think on a very, very recent episode of the podcast uh, that, that uh, as we're recording, this might not even be out yet, um, but I uh, talked about my improvements in sleep since the beginning of, of this year. Now, it's it mm. is still not an, a, an effortless thing. It's still, you know, it's um, while I've made some really big improvements, um, you know, it's it's still it's still effortful. Um, and I'll yeah. still sort of catch myself sometimes on the phone. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Like last night, I well, I didn't get to bed too late. I did have my laptop in bed and I'm like, I, I know better than this. Like, what, what, what am I doing here? Right. So how could 
how could we use hypnosis for this? Yeah, so I know where your question is going to go. So there are certain things that are happening around you that are cues that consciously you're ignoring and overriding, but they're a whole boatload of cues. What I was going to say a moment ago is most people sleep at night. So one of the cues for falling asleep is that the sun has set. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've got all these light bulbs we can turn on now and so on, but the sun still sets and you can use hypnosis to not only for the sun, but the other cues that are around you so that your brain says, I know you want to be on the phone, but I'm going to make you really sleepy right now. And you're going to have no choice but to get into bed and do your routine. Okay. Um, there are things that you know you should be doing, but they're in the wrong part of, almost like they're in the wrong part of your brain. They're not in the part of the brain that executes them. It's they're in the, the, they're in the that, like, theoretical, that. conceptual part the of the thing, brain. Yeah, yeah. And if they're not in the like executing part of the brain. I don't know what that is, but you know, but it's this, a place where good intentions like live. Different things that go on in different parts of the brain. So, you know, so hypnosis c can help you to, even if you want to override and stay on a phone or keep looking at your phone, mm -hmm. that your body's like, no, we're going to sleep right now. Okay. Or have you just, uh, you may not even realize that you just, um, you know, ended a conversation earlier than you might have otherwise, because that part of the brain says, yeah, it's bedtime. We don't talk at this hour and, you know, go on and get ready for bed. Right now, that's not stored in your brain. <laughs> or at least not in the right place. So we use hypnosis to make uh, suggestions that are in the place in the brain where things get executed is about the best way I know how to articulate that. So you're using suggestions to insert a, a stimuli to create a trigger to change the response reaction event sequence. Yes. That's quite the way of putting it. Yes. <laughs> so our, our minds that, the inner part of our mind or subconscious mind or unconscious mind is aware of everything going on around us at all times. Mm -hmm. It takes in every bit of stimuli through all five senses. And then it has to like figure out what parts of things are important to us through what's called a, a reticular activating system. It's part of your brain. The process then tells you what's important. And I'll, what I think happens with hypnosis is we start to kind of reprogram the reticular activating system to notice things that you weren't otherwise noticing. And then from there, tie that to um, suggestions for action of what happens when that piece of stimuli is recognized. And sometimes it's not necessarily recognized fully at a conscious level, but subconscious. Hopefully that made sense the way I said that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, one of the, um, the, the the final things I wanted to touch on here is just the the state of science where uh, where it's at. Um, both the these the sort of evidence um, for both hypnosis just in in general, but also the the evidence or maybe lack of evidence for uh, hypnosis uh, as a treatment for ADHD. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So. Hypnosis, of all the alternative or complementary or integrative modalities out there, is the most heavily researched mm. through scientific research. If you go on to like Google Scholar and just type in hypnosis, you'll get tons of stuff. It is very much well-researched. There are medical books on hypnosis that were published decades ago that are quite valid today, written by medical doctors. It used to be that hypnosis was used primarily by physicians and dentists and psychiatrists. And there's some really wonderfully well-known uh, people in our history of hypnosis that worked in those fields. And today, too. Um, it's not for a lack of science. It's the myths and misconceptions okay. that make people leery of using it because they don't understand what it actually is. But there's tons of science on it. And I was trying to see if there's anything more that they've been uh, publishing around ADHD and hypnosis. And that's kind of uh, not, not so well researched, okay. <laughs> despite all the other research on hypnosis and other things. I did come up with some studies that were done with children uh, around sleep. Mm -hmm. And using hypnosis and found that it definitely had a positive effect. It helped 
to children calm down, fall asleep, and sleep better at night. Um, they've done some things around helping people with... Uh, there was one study I just found uh, the other day that actually they were studying um, the hypnotizability of people, how deeply they'll go into hypnosis. Every person is hypnotizable, but there's a difference in how far into it, we call it depth, uh, how much they experience hypnosis in the phenomena that it creates. And the study was measuring the effect of using methylphenidate or Concerta on hypnotizability in adults who have ADHD. And they took, uh, it was a small study. It was okay. just kind of a preliminary thing. They wanted to see if there was anything there. They selected, I don't know, like 25 adults, I think it was, maybe it was a larger group, who had been diagnosed with ADHD, but had never taken any medications for it. And before the uh, prescribers started to give them medication, they did some hypnosis depth testing on the people and got kind of like, what's the baseline for this person? Mm -hmm. And then um, they had the prescribers that were part of the study figure out what was the right amount of methylphenidate for that person. And then they went and retested for just depth of hypnosis. There weren't any suggestions in particular. They were, given. Mm. They were just measuring how well you went into hypnosis. And they found that those adults that uh, then began taking methylphenidate actually went deeper into hypnosis. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So... There uh, And there was some other things I came across because uh, they did mention in some of the scholarly things that there is this uh, thought that because one might have ADHD and have trouble focusing and having attention, that therefore they have a harder time experiencing hypnosis. And um, the research for that is showing that that's just totally backwards, mm. that in fact, people who have ADHD actually have an easier time experiencing hypnosis than neurotypical people. Probably because of the, the, the imagination piece. and It's the, the imagination piece. We're very good at going into our imagination, getting lost in there sometimes. Right. So the and, problem is coming um, back having out. having no idea what time it is. I kind of think that there's, there possibly could be something around being in a hypnotic-like state that has, that is some part hmm. of the ADHD. But uh, people with ADHD might possibly be more receptive to going into hypnosis and experiencing it. And um, yeah, I don't know. So there's starting to be some research. I think we'll find things involving sleep to be the first studies that come out. But there are other things. It's just that they're not they're not looking at it. It's not that yeah. it doesn't work. It's there's a lack of, and we know it works. But it's it's the science getting the science right. to choose to look at it and do the study correctly because it's always flawed studies. <laughs> and as someone who really, uh, you know, puts a high value on, on rigorous uh, scientific uh, research, I also think it's really, um, it's important to also identify that just because something doesn't have a large body of evidence behind it doesn't mean it's not effective. Um, it's just that the, the, the evidence for it isn't there yet. Um, and so it's kind of a to be determined. So like with, with anything, I mean, one of my, you know, with any kind of treatment, I always suggest starting with where the science is strongest, where the pool of evidence uh, is, you know, I, I hear, I still hear people who say, well, you know, I want to try medication as a last resort. You know, let me try every other thing under the sun before I try medication. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to say from a, well, what we know the research says is that is not a good idea, right? Like try the yeah. for the stuff that is first, you know, we know that medication is, is the frontline treatment for ADHD, but it's, you know, but pills also don't teach skills. Um, and so there, there's a lot of other right. things that we know that has evidence behind it. But if you're doing all the other things right, you're, you know, you're, you're if you, can take medication and it's working for you. Wonderful. If you're, uh, if you're working on sleep, you have a decent, uh, healthy diet, exercise, uh, you have environmental cues, supports, and, and your environment scaffold that around you to support you. Those are all part of that, the, the evidence based kind of multimodal treatment around ADHD. If you're doing yeah. those things and you're like, but what else could I do to maybe help? Right. 
I think that's the point where exploring um, alternative and complementary approaches to, to yeah. ASG has a place, right? I, you know, yeah. I, I, I don't want to be a, an absolutist and say like nothing alternative or complementary has any place anywhere because you know it's I don't I don't think that's that's not very open minded or scientific to even think that way, yeah. right? Because a, a true scientist thinks in a very open yeah. curiosity. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and all the science research requires that somebody thought to research it in the first place. Otherwise, it can't exist in that database of scientific findings. Right, right. So, yeah. all right, we are and coming. That, we are coming to the hour mark here, Linda. Um, mm. What? Um, we, like, really, we may already, have to do another uh, one because we never got to half the other things on the list. But that's good. This but, is the main thing we wanted to talk yes, about. It, it, no, I think this was this was uh, this was really nice. Um, what? And I think it was very ADHD style too, because. <laughs> Seemed all over the place. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, thought, I thought it was fairly focused, and uh, you know, was, I enjoyed the the uh, that hypnosis portion. I found that very uh, yeah. kind of rejuvenating and, and recharging. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, what what do you want to leave? Hey, and that's a resource in your podcast for that's people right. to access over yeah, and over right. again. You know, just going to go to that one segment of that podcast and put it on loop. What do you want so, to leave listeners with? It's very beneficial. With? As far as they can, how they can reach you or any final uh, thoughts or, or uh, ideas you want to you share with final, listeners. One final thought is that your mind is more powerful than you have any idea. There's a lot that's there in your mind that's incredible and we've barely tapped into the power of our mind. Yeah. And um, if people want to get a hold of me, I have a website. It's newhorizonsinhypnosis.com. We will post a link to that on, on the I'll show notes. I'll give this you the link too because I created a page for the podcast specifically and it's not in the main menu. So we'll put that in the show notes. But it's New Horizons in Hypnosis.com and my telephone number is 508 246 2721. Say that one more time. I live in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Phone number is 508 246 2721. I live in Massachusetts, but I do work with people wherever they are because we've got this thing called Zoom. And if Zoom's not around, I'm sure there'd be another video conferencing around. So, but yeah, I work with people wherever they are so they can reach out. Well, Linda, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast and, uh, and, you know, sort of scratching the surface of some new, uh, new domains that we have not yet covered on the podcast. So I hope yeah. this was, uh, um, you guys found this interesting and, um, you know, keeps you, keep, keep staying curious and open. And, uh, you know, if what you're doing now isn't working, try something else. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's cue the banjos and thanks. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, 
You can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel von der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability, and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, and you would be so kind to make that connection for me, I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tiggers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.